Hello, and welcome to our session, Equitable Practices Through a Trauma-Informed Lens. My name is Dr. Nicole Holland Sims. I'm an educational consultant for the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network out of the Harrisburg office. And I also currently serve as a special advisor to the Pennsylvania Department of Education on Equity. At this time, I would love for my colleague to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Dr. Dana Milakovic. I am the mental health, alcohol, and other drug specialist with the Office for Safe Schools in the Department of Education. I also serve as the trauma lead for the Pennsylvania Department of Education. Thank you for joining us today. We are going to review equitable practices in a trauma-informed lens. Today, our focus is going to be on a common integrated language for equity and trauma, and overall, how integration of equitable practices for everyone in the school system is an integral basis for trauma-informed work in our schools. Something that we think is important to start off is to discuss what we're calling four agreements of a courageous conversation. This comes from the work of Glenn Singleton, who wrote the book Courageous Conversations About Race. Anytime you're engaging in conversations that may be a little bit uncomfortable or may cause some, uh, I would say, discomfort around the topic or some angst around the topic, you just want to uh, establish agreements that allow people to feel safe in that conversation. And so with that, we're offering the four for you now. One is to stay engaged. And this simply means that as much as you can, try to listen to, as, to people as they're engaging in conversation, providing yourself the opportunity to take in what they're saying, but also to offer your perspective. And that speaks to speaking your truth. In any case, when we're in the midst of a courageous conversation, you may find yourself saying something or feeling nervous about speaking your truth, but the purpose of this work is to be as authentic as possible. Third, you will experience discomfort. Being uncomfortable is a necessity in the work of equity and also talking about trauma-informed practices. And so in experiencing that discomfort, if we can push through that, we can be the change that we want to see in the world. And lastly, in any type of work that includes looking at equitable practices or trauma-informed practices or systems change, we have to expect and accept non-closure, knowing that this work is ongoing and remains purposeful. Next slide. Language matters when you're talking about creating a common language. So today we really wanna focus on creating common language around equity and trauma-informed practices. Today's session is focused on understanding how equity and trauma-informed practices are an integrated lens with which we function in our daily lives in the school system. To accomplish this, a review of basic definitions related to trauma and equity will be helpful. In Pennsylvania, the definition for the education system of trauma is based on Act 18 of 2019 and has three components. Component one is exposure to an event series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening. But exposure is only part of the picture. Events do not determine outcomes. I'm going to pause for a few seconds and I want you to think about the current pandemic and social unrest across Pennsylvania and the United States. While everyone has been exposed to the same events, the reactions and impact on individuals' mental wellness stress, and overall well-being has varied drastically. Think about what could have caused that difference. What probably came up to mind are things related to resiliency, um, social connectedness, and individuals' ability to access mental health supports, social supports, and um, coping skills. This is why it is important to remember that exposure to the event is not what determines trauma, but rather how the individual experiences that event. This is why components two and three are critical to understanding trauma. In order for trauma to have occurred, the impact of the event needs to be considered. A traumatic response has occurred when the event has lasting adverse impacts and creates significant difficulty in cognitive functioning and physical, social, emotional, mental, or spiritual well-being. 
as I stated at the beginning of this slide, we are basing Pennsylvania's education definition on Act 18 of 2019. But as Pennsylvania moves forward to becoming a trauma-informed state, you will see various definitions coming out of state agencies. I just wanted to note that they will all be very similar with the addition of the education component having the cognitive functioning impact, whereas many other state agencies are not including that. However, all three components listed in this trauma definition are an integral part of Pennsylvania's plan to becoming a trauma-informed state and definition. In the same vein around common language, we thought it was important to share the Pennsylvania definition of equity as it relates to education. It reads as follows. Every student has access to the educational resources and rigor they need at the right moment in their education across race, gender, ethnicity, language, disability, sexual orientation, family background, and or family income. Next slide. Traumatic experiences come in many forms, ranging from one-time events to experiences that are chronic or even generational. Today, we are going to focus on trauma related to inequities experienced by individuals or across generations. So racial trauma or race-based traumatic stress refers to potentially traumatic experiences resulting from any of the following. Direct experiences of racial harassment, which can include threats of harm or injury and being humiliated. Witnessing racial violence towards others, such as hate crimes or violence by law enforcement. It's important to note that this witnessing of racial violence does not include one-on-one -on -one only, but it can also include witnessing it in the news, on social media, or any other type of um, digital platform. Experiencing discrimination and institutional racism. This includes what are called racial microaggressions. These are brief everyday verbal or behavioral exchanges that intentionally or unintentionally communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative racial messages or insults. It's important to remember that when we're talking about trauma, it is again how the individual experiences it. And that is why microaggressions can be so harmful. Whether it is an intentional or it is unintentional, if an individual experiences it as a microaggression and increases their trauma, this is damaging to their internal ideas of their self-belief as well as their feelings of safety in the community. We recognize in certain environments, there may be explicit bias that creates hostile environments for individuals in the school community. And we need to recognize this in order to eliminate personal and systematic bias. The creation of a safe, supportive school climate for all staff, students, and families is a vital part of preventing and addressing cultural and racial trauma in the school setting. Historical trauma has been defined by Dr. Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations, including the lifespan, which emanates from massive group trauma. This collective emotional and psychological injury that occurs over a lifespan and across generations can result from a cataclysmic history of genocide, as well as other um, examples of how a society has been impacted by trauma and the injustice that have been done to those communities. For example, if we look at the negative effects of violent colonization, the dislocation and assimilation policies in the American Indian and Alaska Native communities, such as forced placement in boarding schools. When we look at the communities, we continue to see current struggles with substance abuse, suicide, violence, and a distrust of systems, which includes education. For communities of color, the effects of slavery, segregation, racism, and discrimination may manifest as feelings of hopelessness, increased anger and violence towards self and others, internalized racism, and mistrust of social institutions and systems, such as schools, government, and law enforcement. Other groups that continue to be impacted by historical trauma include Jewish survivors of the Holocaust, Japanese American survivors of World War II internment camps, immigrant populations, and members of our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning communities. 
the cumulative effects of these forms of trauma on youth, families, and communities may manifest in a number of ways that compromise student, family, and community engagement. When we think about cultural trauma, this can encompass historical and racial trauma. We need to think about how it affects the person who experienced the trauma, but also their family. New research suggests that experiencing intense psychological trauma may have a genetic impact on a person's future children. The findings imply that children of individuals who experience profound stress in life, which could include Holocaust survivors, um, or uh, any of the populations that we mentioned before, including our communities of color, may be likely to develop stress or anxiety disorders themselves. At one time, this finding was attributed to the discussion of trauma or an environmental reaction that was occurring in the home. However, there has been more recent research on epigenetics, and epigenetics is the study of factors that determine the activity of a gene in the human genome. It involves changes in gene function that are not based on changes in DNA sequences, but are passed on to future cells. The new research suggests that in addition to genetic traits, life experiences can produce chemical effects in DNA resulting in modified gene expression. Originally, it was believed that these changes occurred only during fetal development. However, New studies are showing that molecular changes in the DNA occur into adulthood. And basically what's occurring is that the DNA inside each cell, they need something a little extra to tell them which genes to, to, to transcribe. And one such element belongs to the methyl group. It works by attaching to the DNA within each cell and it tells it what to select and which genes are necessary for the cell's protein to create the perfect expression. Because the DNA sequence is not changed, epigenetic modifications cannot be detected from DNA sequencing. And these processes can include anything from activating, inactivating X chromosomes to imprinting genes or storing the transcriptional memory of cells. So original, originally researchers noted that the changes in environment and diet could result in DNA changes. And they started looking at families who had experienced significant racial or historical trauma. And what they found was the experiences can be passed down through generations and appear almost as a genetic mutation. Again, noting the genes are not changed, it is the sequencing um, expression that is changed. So these experiences affect brain development. So the trauma never really goes away, even if it has been forgotten by the future generations and not talked about in the family. These experiences appear to be encoded in the transcriptional memory of the cells and they prime a particular gene expression, which is later stimulated. The experiences become part of us as a molecular residue residing in our genetic scaffolding. This means that you may inherit psychological and behavioral tendencies from your ancestors. This includes behavioral traits associated with trauma, but it also includes behavioral traits associated with resiliency. One of the landmark studies for epigenetics and transcriptional memory included studying individuals who lived through the Holocaust, who were in prison camps or were forced to hide in dark, cramped, inhumane conditions and were perpetually afraid that at any moment they might be discovered. This study found that these individuals had low levels of cortisol. Cortisol is a key hormone in fight or flight scenarios and low cortisol levels can greatly affect the quality of life, causing a variety of unpleasant symptoms and health issues, both physical and psychological. Much more significant though, is the discovery that the descendants of those who had suffered war, violence, and incessant fear also have lower levels of cortisol. The research continues to be ongoing and is focused on the biological pathways, including the changes to genomes and prenatal exposure to maternal stress hormones, which then change the genome expression. So one of the things that is frequently talked about when we talk about trauma are adverse childhood experiences. The Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente had an adverse childhood experience study, and it is one of the largest investigations of childhood abuse and neglect and household challenges and how they relate to later life health and well-being. The original adverse childhood experience or ACE study was conducted at Kaiser Permanente 
from 1995 to 1997, and it did two waves of data collection. So they had over 17,000 HMO members from Southern California who were receiving physical exams, complete confidential surveys regarding their childhood experiences. And then they also collected data on their current health status and behaviors. What they found was that ACEs are common across all populations. Almost two thirds of the study participants reported at least one ACE and more than one in five reported three or more ACEs. Some populations are more vulnerable to experiencing ACEs because of the social and economic conditions in which they live, learn, work, and play. The ACE score that is commonly talked about in um, research and the news and media today is the total sum of different categories of ACEs reported by participants. Questions asked related to the first 18 years of life and if they had experienced emotion, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, household challenges, which included mother treated violently, substance abuse in the household, mental illness in the household, parental separation or divorce, incarcerated family members, and emotional or physical neglect. What is important to realize about the ACE study is that studies continue to show that regardless of your resiliency or coping skills, the presence of six or more ACEs can reduce the lifespan and increase the um, health negative, the negative health effects later in life um, significantly. While we recognize that the individual experiences or the ACE as, as harmful, it is important that we think about what is often referred to as a pair of ACEs. So in addition to adverse childhood experiences, we must consider adverse community environments. I just recently said that when they did the ACE study, they found that some people were more prone to having higher levels of ACEs based on the environments in which they live, learn, and play. And this is where the adverse community environments comes into play. Adverse community environments can increase the likelihood or risk factor that a youth will experience an adverse childhood experience. Environments are also impacted by the amount of resources, mental health supports, and disproportionality of supports for economic support. When we're thinking about a school setting, this becomes extremely important because depending on the community in which your school is placed, adverse community environments can be more present and we as a school system can help mitigate the effects of adverse community environments. So now that we know what ACEs are, why do we talk about them? Um, study findings show a graded dose response relationship between ACEs and negative health and well being outcomes. So, in other words, as the number of ACEs increase, so does the risk for a negative outcome. So, how prevalent are ACEs in PA? Estimates from the Department of Health indicate that half of all residents of PA have had at least one ACE, over 19% have three or more and 38% of PA residents have experienced either emotional, physical abuse in childhood. So it's important to remember that ACEs are individual level exposure to a traumatic event. But if we think about the definition of trauma, whether an event or circumstance is traumatic depends on the person's experience of that event. So we as individuals cannot say if an event is traumatic for everyone, um, whether an event is experienced as traumatic is influenced by many factors, including our internal coping resources, our external supports, and broader community, cultural, and societal factors that shape how we understand and respond to our experience. I'm going to have everyone pause and think about what cultural inequities and adverse community environments have been brought into focus as a result of this pandemic throughout the U.S., but specifically PA. The pandemic and recent societal events have brought a spotlight to cultural inequities and adverse community environments that have been present but are not always readily as addressed in a systematic manner. Community inequities are often linked to racism. Testing, treatment, and death rates are impacting Black, Hispanic, American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, or Pacific Islanders more often due to the systematic racism present in society. 
ensuring that we are addressing these components through an equitable trauma-informed lens to continue to reduce disparities and ensure we are continuing to open the lines of communication and build relationships that support students, families, and communities is vital. Some of the things that we have been seeing include the social and economic factors, housing, educational attainment, poverty levels, and environment and neighborhood conditions. Looking at, is there healthy food? Are resources available for food, for sanitation, for support, whether that be financial support or community support? These are ways that we need to think about a system-wide level and the disparities that exist throughout Pennsylvania. When we think about the current pandemic and social unrest across PA in the US, it's important to think about how each of these factors influence the youth you are working with. When we think about a systems model, we understand that we have the child um, in our school setting or the youth in our school setting for a period of time but they also interact with different levels, um, including media, neighbors, the society as a whole, um, and making sure that we are thinking about everything that exists outside of our school setting, as well as how we can impact that and change what we do in the school setting to support them is important. We've thought about potential challenges and inequities, but it's also important to think about what opportunities have occurred, such as decreased stigma around mental health, increased awareness of the social inequities across Pennsylvania, increased system focus on disproportionality and systematic racism, and an increase in a system-wide focus on addressing these systematic inequities, including racism and bias against individuals based on their sexual orientation or gender identity. The term complex trauma describes both exposure to multiple traumatic events from an early age and the immediate and long-term effects of these experiences over the course of a development. Examples have typically included adverse community environments, chronic abuse, neglect, or exposure to family violence, as well as other forms of violent victimization experienced from an early age without adequate adult support to manage these experiences. These types of trauma is particularly devastating because it occurs during critical period of brain development before a child has had the chance to develop strong, positive ways to cope with stress. It is important to recognize uh, that racism and an inequitable access throughout the United States that has been brought to the forefront in the past months highlight the systematic inequities and institutional bias in terms of resources, discipline, opportunities. When we think about the last few months, we have to consider complex trauma and the reactions we see as we continue to navigate our current school year. While not every staff member and student will be traumatized from recent events, it is important to remember they have been exposed to a traumatic events. And as we focus on the remainder of the year, we cannot forget to address systematic inequities that have been highlighted during the pandemic. And remember that they affect every school district across Pennsylvania. When we think about youth with complex trauma, we know that they're likely to exhibit a range of behavioral and academic difficulties that require additional intervention by adults in the school community. As our previous Secretary of Education, Pedro Rivera stated, our educators are change agents and we have the ability to dismantle systematic barriers to ensure our students have success. To do this, we must ensure that we are open to understanding what our students and our families experience and how they are feeling. It's important to note that while we present the PA data as overall Pennsylvania residents, the risk of trauma exposure is higher among certain groups of students based on their particular experiences, both historically and present. For example, youth of color ages 12 to 19 are victims of violent crime more often than their white peers. Youth of color are three times more likely to be victims of a robbery and five times more likely to be victims of a homicide. And homicide continues to be the leading cause of death among youth of color ages 15 to 24. African-American youth living in urban low-income communities are more at risk of exposure to violence than any other population in the United States. American Indian, Alaska Native children and youth are two and a half times more likely to experience trauma than their peers and other groups at increased risk of exposure to trauma include children and youth who have disabilities, 
who are refugees, experience homelessness, live in poverty, or are part of the LGBTQ community. When we think about um, having an equitable trauma-informed approach, we need to think about what this means in Pennsylvania. Again, um, we, this was defined in Act 18 of 2019, so we will be using that definition of a trauma-informed approach. This definition, um, trauma-informed approach, involves core components. It has a school-wide approach to education and a classroom-based approach to student learning. So again, thinking your school climate and how it feels to have an inclusive, equitable school climate. Addressing the need to recognize the signs and symptoms of trauma, so training and professional development. Having schools respond by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, professional learning, policies, procedures, and practices. And then noting that the overall purpose of having a trauma-informed approach is that we recognize there is a presence and onset of trauma, and we wanna resist the reoccurrence of trauma and promote resiliency tailored to a school entity's culture, climate, demographics, and the community as a whole. So when we think about how do we do that, um, one of the ways that we can do that is by focusing on the five core values of a trauma-informed care. This is a foundational component for planning and implementing an equitable trauma-informed approach. To plan for and implement equitable trauma-informed approaches in schools, we have to understand these five core values and view them as a lens through which we view everything that happens in the school. This includes teaching, our learning activities, our rules, our discipline procedures, how our staff and our system wellness occur, and any other school policy. For the purposes of this presentation, we're going to introduce the core values, but we will be focusing on cultural sensitivity. So safety for everyone is foundational to using a trauma-informed approach. And often when we say safety, we immediately think physical safety. Um, but I want to invite everyone to really think beyond physical safety. This includes behavioral, academic, emotional, and social safety as well. Attending to and nurturing all aspects of safety in the school promote optimal learning environments for everyone. Safety is embedded throughout the multi-tiered system of support with a focus on universal practices that create a, self, a safe culture and a climate for all students and staff and families. Trustworthiness is the ability to be relied on as honest and truthful. This essential value applies to everyone in the school. Students who are impacted by trauma do not naturally trust the adults in their world. Their experience with adults is that they frequently say one thing and do another. And when we think about the families that we interact with, they also do not naturally trust systems. So families that have the experience trauma may be distrustful of the educational system. And so they expect the same thing as their students do. So ensuring that we're thinking about transparency is so important when we think about trustworthiness. So transparency involves holding people accountable for their actions, connecting with students, staff, parents, and the community and focusing on a relationship building. In a transparent system, organizational operations and decisions are conducted with transparency with the whole goal being that we're maintaining our trust with our students, our family members, our staff in the community. By explicitly focusing on building trustworthiness, educators create an environment where staff, students, and families believe the adults like them for who they are, and they are willing to support their growth while respectfully challenging students and families to move forward in their learning. The third value is collaboration. We've already touched on collaboration when we discussed trustworthiness, but through the lens of an equitable trauma-informed work, we really want to think about collaboration as involving the concept of mutuality. So this concept places importance on partnering and how we level the power differences between staff, students, families, and among organizational staff. So this includes everyone from your clerical and custodial personnel to professional staff administrators and superintendents. This concept demonstrates that healing happens in relationships and it's important to focus on the relationships with an understanding that sharing the power and decision making is part of an equitable trauma informed approach. So when we engage in collaboration, we have to understand when shared power is possible and when staff must retain the right to make decisions. So one example of when staff must retain the right um, to make decisions is key safety decisions. Those would not be a collaborative um, discussion necessarily 
especially in the moment. Um, but identifying which category falls into, is this a student, staff, family, community, or shared, is helpful for everyone to see the whole picture. And it helps us understand that not every decision needs to be a power struggle between staff or staff and students. When schools are focused on engaging in equitable trauma-informed approaches, staff continually have to find ways to empower students and families. Empowering students and families include ensuring that you're building on individual strengths and experiences, fostering a belief in the beliefs of students and families' resiliency, and the ability of students and families to heal and promote recovery from trauma. It also involves ensuring educational staff feel safe and supported. An important part of empowering families is ensuring they have a voice. Voice in this context is understanding that families and students may have historically been unheard or have been marginalized. In an equitable trauma-informed system, it is understood that this lack of being heard is its own form of trauma and the school system works to correct that by helping them feel included and that our families and our students feel heard and listened to. Schools understand the experience of trauma may be a unifying aspect in the lives of those who run the organization, their educators, students, and or families. And policies and procedures are developed to foster empowerment for staff, families, and students. School systems understand the importance of power differentials and the way in which families and students historically have been diminished in voice and choice and often feel they have no power in decision making and actively work to include them in decision making. The final trauma-informed core value is cultural sensitivity. Engaging in culturally sensitive practices involves schools and districts building in equity work to move past stereotypes and bias. This includes offering access to gender responsive services, acknowledging the natural healing value of traditional cultural connections, and ensuring policies and procedures are responsive to racial, ethnic, and cultural needs of the students and families. It is impossible to engage in trauma-informed work if a system is also not pursuing equitable practices. In schools, one way to pursue equity is through what has long been called culturally responsive practices, which recognize the importance of culture in all aspects of teaching and learning, as well as the importance of diversifying instructional concepts. In healthcare, Practitioners who, perform, who pursue equity often use the term of cultural humility to describe their journey towards equity. Because trauma-informed in, in schools is the intersection of education and health field, we want you to be aware that the two fields have slightly different terminology for the same basic set of dispositions and practices. I love the term, term cultural humility. And when we're thinking about cultural humility, what we're doing is we're recognizing that we can never be fully competent in someone else's cultural experience. And that no group has a culture that shares all the same belief systems. We're embracing curiosity, we're engaging in self-reflection, and we really are seeking to understand how values such as safety, empowerment, collaboration, and trustworthiness are defined not only through an individual's experience, but also through experiences such as trauma, historical trauma, oppression, cultural obliteration, institutional racism, and interpersonal racism. We understand and accept that the cultural context is relevant to our students, our staff, and our families' definitions of our trauma-informed values. When implementing equitable trauma-informed approaches, it is important to understand that all people have bias as a result of their experiences and their culture, and that these bias are often unconscious in nature. Addressing how we address the knowledge-based skills and understanding that are required to successfully teach and interact with students and to work effectively with colleagues from a variety of cultures by holding all forms of cultural difference in high esteem or the development of cultural proficiency requires a deliberate focus. As we think about Dana saying that it's impossible to engage in trauma-informed work if the system is not also pursuing equitable practices, I'm thankful to alert everyone to the Pennsylvania Department of Education's equity pillars of practice. And these pillars of practice are supportive around systems, whether they're educational systems, higher educational systems, or pre-K systems, focusing on what is it that they can do to operationalize equity in their particular uh, catchment. And so the pillars of practice are listed there for you. 
They begin with general equity practices, self-awareness, which really talks about what Dana just concluded around. How do we know what biases we hold? How do we know what powers and privileges we hold and how we show up to people and how they show up to us? In addition to that, it's important to know what data is telling us in our respective systems, whether or not we're disproportionate, whether or not we're responsive, and whether or not we are exhibiting cultural humility. We then also can speak to the data to help inform us around being more authentic in our family and community engagement. And so we want the input of our families and communities to help us to know whether or not our systems are adequate in supporting the best thing that they have, which is the students that they put in front of us. The next two are really interrelated in a lot of ways, academic equity and disciplinary equity. And as we think about academic equity, it, it stands to reason that we have to think about it from the form of access. And so access may be access to Wi-Fi, access to content and curriculum, access to a safe learning environment. And I love that Dana mentioned how safety is really dynamic. It's not just physical safety. And so as we think about access to those types of environments, it also lends itself to disciplinary equity where students have a sense of belonging and also are receiving teaching about behavior and teaching about restoration in a way that's healthy and restores uh, any harm that may be done. And so those two things, as I said, are interrelated, but they are specific in some ways. And so each of them have been delineated in the Equitable Practices Hub, which on the right-hand side, you can see the icons that represent each of the pillars of practice. And when you access the Pennsylvania uh, Equitable Practices Hub, you can take a deeper dive around each one of those. Next slide. And so one of the things that I think is important to think about is this concept of will, fill, and skill. And so Dana mentioned cultural humility. And as we think about being culturally responsive, a lot of times people that are anxious or excited to begin this work have a will. They have the desire to lead. They want to commit to achieving equitable outcomes for all students. But sometimes it goes from will immediately to skill. And without the fill, we won't be able to be as responsive as possible to the needs or uniqueness of the students and families that we support. And so that fill part is really critical. It's gaining cultural knowledge about ourselves, that self-awareness component, and also others. You'll see within the picture, it says know the communities, and that cannot be understated. And so once we have the will and the fill, then we can move to applying knowledge and leading the change and skillfully putting beliefs and learning into action. And that's the key component. How do we get to application? And sometimes we wanna to move too fast, but we need to take that time to engage in the fill. Next slide. And so one of the things that can help us in this journey as school leaders, as school counselors, as school psychologists, as educator systems change agents is to think about what are the essential elements of cultural proficiency. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna list these out for you and just give a brief definition. So number one is to value diversity. And this is where you claim your differences. You're, you're accepting and willing and embracing of the differences that are at your fingertips, whether that's in people or in systems and incorporate those differences into the curriculum and acknowledge the contribution of various cultural and ethnic groups through teaching and lessons. Number two is to assess the culture. So this is actually naming the differences, not being afraid to talk about the differences that exist or the uniqueness in the people that you have um, in your system. Recognize how your culture affects the culture of others. Describe your own culture and the cultural norms of your organization and understand how the culture of your organization affects those with different cultures. So if we're used to swimming in the water and someone new jumps in the water and they're not accustomed, they're gonna have a tough time. And because we're accustomed to our water, we don't recognize that some things may be new, the norms may be different for someone who's new to that setting. Number three is manage the dynamics of difference, develop a process for cross-cultural communication, and create a cross-cultural conflict mediation plan. 
one thing we talk about is cultural dissonance. When there's a disconnect between whether that's an individualized culture or a system culture, how do we as leaders help to mediate some of those uh, conflicts that tend to arise when there are those differences? Number four, institutionalized cultural knowledge. And this is incorporating cultural knowledge into, let's say, teacher induction plans, weaving it into professional development, and structuring opportunities to engage parents, families, and communities. So making the policy really drive the practice is number four. And then finally, number five, adapting to diversity. Realizing that change is challenging but it's also healthy and revisiting community needs and values to ensure that they're in alignment with school policies and resources. Next slide. So what are some of the barriers to what we hope to see in the essential elements? Um, they're as follows. The presumption of privilege and entitlement, feeling as though why should we change anything if it's benefiting the, the collective majority, there's no need for change. A system of oppression, whether those are policies that have historically been in place for a very long time. We know in education, there are a lot of policies that, whether we know it or not, are oppressive to certain groups. And so that's important to recognize. Awareness of the need to adapt, unawareness, I'm sorry, of the need to adapt. So that's feeling like, well, there's nothing wrong. We don't see an issue. We would term this cultural blindness and not being willing to see or totally oblivious to the fact that there is a, an issue that needs to be addressed. And then lastly, resistance to change flat out. Um, it, it says what it means, resistance is crucial to acknowledge, name, and to persist through. Because people, as we know, really struggle with change. But as we said before, change is healthy and it's important to push through that discomfort. Next slide. How do these barriers sound in school? So I know that I'll probably be saying things that you have heard at some point, but we want to acknowledge that these are things that really stall the progress of equitable practices. Their parents won't come to parent conferences because they don't care about the education of their children. Why try to help them? They will just end up in jail just like their dad. Don't put these kids in my class. I'm not a special ed teacher. These are comments that come often and yet have to be acknowledged and addressed so that we can again push through them and have those courageous conversations to change the outcomes for students to promote cultural proficiency. Next slide. So what is implicit bias? Uh, Dana, as she talked about cultural sensitivity, highlighted how important it is for us to know what bias really means. And when we think about implicit bias, these are the biases that we tend to have that are unconscious. So on the next slide, it's gonna talk a little bit more about what that means. It says that we generally tend to hold implicit bias that favor our own in-group, and th this cannot be more true. So I often use the example that I went to Millersville University. I tend to gravitate towards people that also went to Millersville, but if I meet someone from a different state uh, university, I might not have the same connection, and I may have my own bias about them going to that particular institution. That's an example of favoring your, your own in-group. We also know that biases are malleable, they can be changed, but they're also pervasive. They happen on a consistent basis. We have like a, a video recorder in our brain that captures all of the, the media and the messaging, and that informs the biases that we hold, and we may not intend to know or intend to use them, but they come out without us being aware. That speaks to the difference between implicit and explicit biases because they're very distinct mental constructs. Explicit means outward, it's in your face. Implicit, we tend to not know they're happening. And what's interesting is that those associations that we hold, those implicit associations, don't always necessarily align with what we declare to believe. And that's often why when we train on implicit bias, light bulbs go off for certain people because it's a, it's a moment of aha, I didn't realize those were the things or the actions that I was taking as a result of those implicit biases. Next slide. And so what, do, what does implicit bias lead to? In schools, what we see are ambiguous judgments. So things like uh, determining if a student should be referred to the office for something like disrespect. There's ambiguity in that, it's subjective. It also leads to snap decisions, being in a state of just referring to or reflecting on our immediate 
thought about a certain person or a certain group, it creates that snap decision. And then lastly, unconscious behavior. This could be a teacher standing on one side of the room where most of the students are students that she uh, connects more with, remember favoring that own in-group and not realizing that she might be neglecting the other side of the classroom unconsciously. Just as a quick question, where do you see implicit bias impacting decisions for students? I'll give you a couple seconds to just think about that because when we get to the Q&A portion, we may be able to hear some of those examples from you. So keep that question in mind. Where do you see implicit bias impacting decisions for students? Next slide. And so what we want to have you think about as we sort of transition out of the content portion of the session is a case study. And so for the purpose of, of this session, I'm going to read this out for you and, and leave you with a question that when we do transition, we hope to get some feedback from you around. So the case study begins that Columbus School District is a mid-sized urban school school district. Current enrollment in Columbus is about 10,573. However, enrollment has been on a steady decline given the poor academic performance and reputation of the district. One of the elementary school principals in the school district is a native to the area, has a strong desire to shift the morale of the staff at her building, and encourage them to support all students in all areas, academics, behavior, and social emotional learning. At a kickoff faculty meeting, the principal starts the meeting by asking each staff member to reflect upon his or her favorite teacher and why they chose that person. After the activity, she asks the staff to think about their implicit biases and how that impacts student achievement. One staff member walks out of the meeting and says that the issues are not about what they as staff are doing wrong, but rather the students and community just aren't willing to be educated. He goes on to express that the students aren't interested in education, but rather being out quote unquote in the street. And how can school compete with that? The principal tries to understand the staff member's perspective, but insists that these types of activities will be provided throughout the school year. And it is imperative that all members participate. As you think about that case study, the questions that we have are, when attempting to achieve buy-in from staff, did the principal approach this meeting in a way to meet that goal? And what are some other recommendations you'd suggest to the principal to consider, particularly in your role as a school counselor? Next slide. So becoming a trauma-informed school who focuses on equity does not involve investing in another framework or program. Um, what Nicole and I really want to think about and have you think about is a lens. So instead, having equitable trauma-informed practices are a way to enhance your school or your district's existing multi-tiered system of support or MTSS. We understand that not every school is involved in a formal MTSS process, but the reality is, is that every school does engage in MTSS to some extent because you offer some supports to all students and then you individualize supports to other students. Um, so the foundational components for an equitable MTSS and a trauma-informed school are the same. Both involve continuous improvement rooted in 11 key features, including equity, high-quality instruction, strategic use of data, collaboration, family and community engagement, strong shared leadership, positive school climate, development of a continuum of supports, strong universal practices, systematic implementation and use of evidence-based practices. Through these key features, an equitable trauma-informed school strengthens the foundational pur pur purpose of a strong MTSS, um, which includes making schools more effective and equitable learning environments. We want to ensure our environments are consistent, predictable, positive, and safe. As we move towards creating equitable trauma-informed systems, it's important that we realize the most important thing that we can do is create positive, safe, stable, and supportive relationships with youth. This continues to be the number one protective factor for youth. And so before we move into the Q&A, I wanna review a study um, because often what Nicole and I hear when we're working with schools is there's so many things happening how can we make a difference? We're one person. We're trying to maybe be a change agent, but we're unable to make change in our system and we don't feel like we're making a difference. 
Um, so I want to review a study that was published regarding positive childhood experiences and adult mental and relational health. So this study was unique in that it not only addressed positive childhood experiences, but it also looked at adverse childhood experience levels. So what was found was that positive childhood experiences show dose response associations with adult mental health and relational health, even when you account for ACEs. So this means that fostering safe, stable, nurturing relationships for children affect their outcome later in life. And the more positive childhood experiences a child has, the higher their chances of a positive outcome. As we think about positive childhood experiences, several were school or school community related and including had at least two non-parent adults who took a genuine interest in them, feeling supported by friends, feeling a sense of belonging at high school, and enjoyed participating in community traditions. The additional positive childhood experiences involved family relationships and included felt able to talk to families about feelings, felt family stood by them during difficult times, and felt safe and protected by adults in the home. So what we want to leave you with before we move into the Q&A is a thought that how you impact your students is how you impact their relationships. Being able to have a relationship with a student impacts their ability to develop coping skills and resiliency, both during their childhood, but also helps them develop supportive, positive relationships later in life. We've included some resources in the slide deck for you um, that relate to equitable, equitable practices. Um, the first one is the Equitable Practices Hub that Nicole talked about earlier. And the rest of these do relate to either equity or trauma and mental wellness throughout um, the Department of Education. The contact information for both Nicole and I is listed on this slide and we are available with any questions or comments that you have. Um, as a follow-up to this presentation. <laughs> 